Hi Crypto Devs, Liarco here. In today's video, I'm gonna show you how to configure and also deploy the Safe NFT Metadata Provider version 2. And by the end of the video, I'm also gonna share some tips about how you can make this tool do much more than just revealing your NFTs. Let's get into it. Okay, so first of all, the code I'm gonna use can be found in its dedicated repo by the Ashlips Lab. I'll leave a link in the description. By the time this video will be published, the version 2 of the Safe NFT metadata provider will be officially released. But at the moment, it's still in beta, so I will deploy it from the dedicated branch. Don't worry, you will be able to do everything from the main repo page. Let's take a quick look at the requirements. The app has been completely rewritten in TypeScript and runs on Node.js. You will have to install Node locally in case you want to customize the app or run it on your machine. But in this video, we will deploy it straight to the cloud. Object storage services usually provide you with a web interface to manage your files, but NFT collections can be quite big, so I recommend using a client like CyberDuck. If you don't know how to set up and use DigitalOcean Spaces as well as CyberDuck, I'll leave a link in the description to help you with that. The data will be stored and also served through an S3 compatible storage. DigitalOcean has a very cool product called Spaces which is perfect for this purpose. Our app is gonna query the blockchain in order to get information about the collection and listen to events. In order to do this, the easiest way is to use a Web3 provider. Any RPC node should work. You can even use free public providers if available for your network. The first thing to do is to have all of our collection files to the cloud storage. In my case, I have CyberDuck already connected to a testing space on DigitalOcean. It's important to note that spaces are the same thing as S3 buckets on AWS. So whenever you hear me talking about buckets or spaces, that's basically the same thing. Depending on your needs, you may want to use a dedicated bucket for your collection or using the same bucket for multiple things. Here, I have a dedicated folder for this example collection and it's called Fake Token. Inside of it, I have some folders which follow the default configuration expected by the Safe NFT metadata provider. I have a private folder and inside of that, I have a metadata folder and an assets folder. Also, I uploaded my collection files to these folders. Keep in mind that the image property of the metadata files will be replaced automatically by the app, so you can leave it as is, there is nothing special to do. By default, your files will be always uploaded as private, but you should always check this before going on. I copy the URL for at least one of the files and I open it in the browser. If you get an access denied error, then your data is protected. You can even use completely random paths so nobody will be able to guess them, but that should not be considered as a good protection. Once the files are ready, we can start with the deployment on DigitalOcean. The same repo can be deployed to any other service provider which supports automated app builds and deployments for Node.js apps but DigitalOcean makes it super easy to create one-click deployment buttons like this. If you are already signed in, clicking the button will take you directly to the deployment wizard and most of the configuration will already be set for you. The first thing to do is to tweak the plan. Make sure that you set one single container since you won't need more than one worker running at the same time. In fact, Having multiple replicas may result in a complete mess. During tests, you can also move to the basic category and pick the smallest plan. Since the required resources are very low, I would say this should be absolutely fine for production too. But any plan from the pro list will be fine as well, and you will find options for as low as 12 US dollars a month, so it's very affordable. Remember that you are gonna need this service as long as your collection isn't sold out or you wanna keep your metadata hidden. So whenever you decide to switch your contract to IPFS, then you can stop paying for this service. Once you are okay with the plan, you can move on to the next step. There are no global environment variables since all of them are set for the specific worker. 
The RPC endpoint is the URL to the Web3 provider. In this case, I'm setting my Infura key for the RingB network. You can create an Infura project for free. I'm gonna create one quickly. The contract address and the start token ID should be self-explanatory. They depend on your collection. Then we have to set the private and public paths for our assets. There is also a global prefix that we can set down below. So here I'm gonna leave everything as default. You can also set a custom asset extension in case your images are not PNGs. Paths for metadata work exactly the same as for assets. But then we have public assets URI template. This variable will be used in order to update the image property of your metadata once a new token is revealed. It must be set to the public URI that points to the assets inside your S3 bucket. A quick way to generate this, if you're using the default configuration, is going to your space. Getting the public URL of a random asset. And then replace the private folder name with public. Last but not least, the token ID has to be replaced with this placeholder string. I'm okay with the extension since my assets are PNG files, but you should check everything matches your files and configuration. The S3 access key, secret key and endpoint depend on your S3 storage provider. In my case, I'm setting my own keys for the spaces service and the endpoint must use the correct region subdomain, which for me is Frankfurt 1. The bucket name is Liarco dash YouTube. And the prefix is my main folder called fake dash token. If you place your files into the root path of your bucket, then you can leave this blank. The last two variables are used in order to configure the app behavior. Full refresh delay is the number of seconds the app should wait before running a full check of the old collection in order to make sure nothing has been skipped because of some errors. It defaults to 60 minutes and I highly recommend you don't set it lower than this. Remember that in normal conditions your tokens will be automatically revealed at each mint, so the full refresh should be considered as an emergency check, so you don't have to refresh it manually in case something strange happens. Ok, little thing to say here because development never stops and since I recorded the video there have been some improvements. The next variable you see here is not needed anymore, so the tokens reveal after mint should happen immediately. We are gonna find a few more patches to this video, but for now, simply ignore the mint reaction delay variable, because you won't find it in your deployment unless you're using an old or unstable version. Once you set all the environment variables, you can move on to the next step. The Information tab allows you to give a custom name to the app and also specify a project and a region for your deployment. I recommend choosing the same region as your space in order to get better performances. The last step is to review the app. If you are ok with it, then you can create the resources. The deployment will start immediately, and you can follow the whole process here. Once it's done, you can move to the runtime logs in order to see some messages from the app. My demo collection has 4 minted tokens out of 12, so as you can see, 
the first four tokens have been revealed during the initial full refresh. If I refresh the CyberDuck folder, you can see that now I have a public folder where all the files can be accessed publicly. Now I can go to my space, and get the URI for one of the tokens. Here is metadata for token number one, and the image property has been updated by the app. If I open the URI for the image as well, we can see the correct image file. In case you are wondering what the URI prefix would be for your revealed collection, it would be this string here, including the last slash. Now let's mint a couple of tokens so we can verify that the app is reacting to mint events. First of all, I open the URI of the next metadata in order to verify that it returns an error. And as you can see, access denied. So it's correct. The app runtime log have a timeout, so if the page stays open for too long, you stop getting new messages. They will show up if you refresh the page, but you won't see them in real time. That's why I'm gonna refresh the page. Now it's time to mint a couple of tokens. I'll do this from Etherscan in order to save some time, but if you're using any dApp, then it's absolutely the same. Okay. Now we wait for the transaction to be confirmed and then we should get some feedback in the runtime logs. Here is another quick patch during the cut. You can see here that the runtime log is talking about a delay of 10 seconds. As I already explained, this has changed in the final version, so at this point you will simply get the feedback about the reveal process. And here you have it, the new tokens have been revealed. If we now open the URIs for token number 5 and token number 6, we can access both the metadata and the images. And if we test token number 7, we will get an error. So it's working. Version 2 is very easy to use and also very cheap compared to version 1 because the app is simply copying the files between the private and the public folders, but it's not serving them directly. Now I want to quickly show you the main file of this project. Since this version is using TypeScript, it's also really easy to customize its behavior and you can do crazy stuff with it. The main file is very small and the whole app is based on three core concepts. Last patch to this video, I promise. You will probably notice that the line numbers in your codebase are shifted a bit compared to the video, and you may also spot some minor differences as well. Don't worry, that's totally fine, and the things I'm about to explain do apply anyway. Collection status providers get information about the tokens that should be revealed and exposes this data to the system. Data updaters are classes that perform actions when a token has to be revealed or hidden. The default code uses these two classes which copy the metadata and assets files from the private folder to the public one. Runtimes are background services that react to external events or timers and trigger the update of a specific token or the whole collection. The library comes with two examples. The first one updates the whole collection at every given amount of seconds. The other one reacts to every mint event emitted by the contract and updates the brand new token. All the classes you see here implement interfaces that can be used in order to create custom extensions. For instance, I tested this by creating extensions to send an email each time that a new token is minted, generate a new token on the fly based on information taken from the chain, or even turning on an LED on an Arduino board on Mint. If you want to know more about this, drop some crazy idea in the comments and I'm gonna pick one for a video where I show you how to extend this app. This is what I really love about this tool, its versatility. You can do much more compared to the previous version and it's so easy to do it. 
In one of the next videos, I'm also gonna show you how I used it for the mutation drop by the Degen Tunes. So stay tuned. As always, if you have any questions or anything you would like to see in the next videos, please let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching and bye.